what we're doing. Are we good? We're live. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Juba, South Sudan. Um, so that's beautiful trouble. And I'll show the, the folks joining us as well. Beautiful Trouble, the book. There's been a number of other books and resources, uh, games, card games, etc., in various languages, um, distributed all around the world. Now with uh, you know networks of communities that are using this, um, especially across the global south, and I think this is what's quite interesting. It's that you know it's a it's a very distributed network trying to learn together about how we do struggle. The next, uh, the next uh, sort of sponsor of this session is MSTCDC. This is my employer. They um, were gracious enough to send Dr. Irene and myself here to Juba to be with you all. Uh, MSTCDC was established in the late 60s, early 70s during, uh, established in the late 60s, early 70s during uh, Walim Julius Nyerere's administration in Tanzania. And he established this center for international cooperation and solidarity together with the government of Denmark. And uh, for over half a century now, this has served as a Pan-African convening space. Uh, any day, pick a day and, and visit us, you'll find people from all over the continent and elsewhere, uh, including Global North and Global South countries uh, from all continents. And. Um, what this center does is it's focused on capacity building for progressive civil society, for trade unions, for movements. It's, um, you know, it's got very equipped spaces, you know, with uh, all kinds of digital tech uh, to run gatherings. It hosts digital convenings as well. It has one of the most reputable Swahili language and culture programs. Um, even uh, Ivy League schools, Princeton, Yale, Miss, you know, all kinds of schools uh, from around the world as well as uh, East Africa as a region have partnerships through these kind of uh, culture and language programs um, as well as other disciplines. And um, we have some, uh, as some of you are aware, and, and you got some flyers the other day. Um, if you didn't get one, you can, you can touch base with us and we can connect you. Um, uh, we, all, we also have undergraduate programs and we're starting some, you know, graduate academics as well. Um, but primarily, historically, it served as a convening and cooperation space and a learning space, not only for formal education, but also for the kind of stuff that we're doing here. And um, there, there are constantly, you know, political gatherings at this place. Um, we'll be hosting comrades from Palestine in about a month. We have uh, the Global People Power Forum coming up in early February. Um, if anybody has their own transport funding and would like to join us, uh, feel free to, to talk with us. Um, and maybe the most uh, sort of like uh, useful thing, like immediately useful thing that I, can, that I can share from TCDC is that it's part of a new network called MOVE. MOVE is a, is a partnership between India, Nigeria, TCDC, and Arusha, uh, which is historically a very Afro-socialist town. It's where the Arusha Declaration was made and, and created a vision for Ujamaa. Um, and, also, and also Denmark is the other partner in this kind of four-country coordinating steering committee for this global movement support club called MOVE. Mm -hmm. And MOVE has a number of components. I won't get all into it, but I will share in the WhatsApp thread um, some links to free classes, free online classes about social movements, about organizing, about cooperation, um, and... Um, you know, we're sort of able to see on the back end how far are people around the world going with these classes? Are they enlisting new members to take them? Is there more that we can do together to partner together? Um, and, and MOVE also has all kinds of things like direct action funds, uh, participatory action research partnerships, uh, funds for, you know, uh, TCDC. And then finally, um, I have to give a, a really important vote of thanks to a group called Solidarity Uganda that I've had the privilege of being a member of for um, ever since it started, uh, maybe 2009, 2010 rather. Um, and uh, for the first time, I think in this small organization's history, um, they used some discretionary funding to send Mazira to, to, to join us. It's the first, the first time that they've uh, put somebody on, on a plane, you know, to go to an international um, uh, convening with comrades um, using discretionary funding. So I think that's a, 
that's something uh, really generous, you know, from from our neighbors, you know, a few hundred miles south of here. And um, Solidarity Uganda might be the largest national level political education and resistance network in Africa. It has defeated a number of large scale land grabbers. We're talking about transnational corporations. We're talking about uh, militias. We're talking about highly connected to state house and to imperial powers, uh, politicians backed by arms and all kinds of sanctions at their uh, disposal against us. Uh, we're talking about a powerful network of you know, rural women, of youth, urban and rural youth, that have defeated some of the most powerful actors in the world and continue to struggle against Museveni's dictatorship, against imperialism, and all of the the, the, you know, the, the, the capitalist backing of, of, uh, of, of this uh, fascist and despotic uh, administration. And um, uh, also Solidarity Uganda has done a lot of work um, across the continent with uh, comrades in Swaziland. Eswatini is under, is under a monarchy uh, with comrades uh, here in South Sudan, with comrades in Sudan, which uh, recently had a, you know, people's uprising in recent years. Uh, building, you know, cross-border kind of coalitions within East Africa, trying to reimagine what, what does Pan-Africanism mean today in this generation? Um, so this is a, this is a, it's just a, for me a very important um, opportunity to, to, to welcome them into the room, even though they're not physically here with us, and to appreciate John for making the journey as well. So with all that being said, Thank you to our three sponsors that I've mentioned for this session. And um, now I want to introduce Stella. <laughs> Sorry? Can I stay here? What would you like to do, Stella? I'll stay here. I'm tired, but I can do power from here if it's OK. okay. Uh, as I introduce you, maybe you could get like uh, two minutes to collect your energy. Yeah? No, I'm cool. <laughs> Where would you all like Stella to be? Okay. Anywhere she wants to be. Oh, there. Oh, okay. Very weak. We'll get there. We'll get there. Still alone there. Still alone there. An amazing day, yeah? Stella, welcome. So Matei has already, through his photography, uh, begun to introduce Stella. Yes. I'm sure many people after the session will want to look at some of the photos hanging in the room as well, Stella. Stella is a good family friend and comrade of mine. Um, my partner is uh, working on a film about Stella that's won you know, all kinds of global international awards and struggling to, to get it done, hopefully by the end of next year. Um, Stella and I, I think, met in Luzira prison, is it? Probably, for the first yeah, time. I think so, for the first time. <clears throat> uh, Stella, you know, has been a political prisoner for her poetry and resistance to the Museveni regime. And, um, you know, Museveni is a, is a dictator well-backed by the U.S., well-backed by Chinese allies, well-backed, you know, he plays whoever, the EU, whoever comes to him. The best deal, I'll take it, you know. Uh, she's a very loving and affirming person. Very loving and affirming person. Known for her rudeness. Known for her vulgarity. Known for her disruptiveness. Um, but when you when you talk with her as a human, as most of us have, uh, if you've seen her like maybe on TV or social media, I know she has a massive social media following. Uh, you're like, is, is this the same person? Uh, indeed, it's the same person. Person, and uh, she got to know actually my my partner quite well while I was here in South Sudan. No, actually, we were in Kenya with with uh, some of the Onad comrades, and um, uh, they were walking. Um, thanks, man, for all the blocking. <laughs> uh, they were. Um, marching together for women's security in Kampala uh, during one week that I was in Kenya with some of you from South, Su from South Sudan. And um, a number of youth in, in, in Kampala had uh, been mourning a femicide that happened about five years ago. Um, and there was censorship of this femicide. Uh, 
all women's names, you know, sort of censored, the media intimidated. Uh, we weren't getting information about why young, young women, I say women, some of them were girls below the age of 18, just being killed left, right, and center systematically. Um, so we dug up information, whatever information we could find about the names and ages and workplaces and communities that these um, young women and girls were from, and we embroidered a huge kilt. It was inspired by uh, the work of a Mexican artist who did something quite similar. And um, so my partner and a bunch of youth um, from Greater Kampala marched with uh, this kilt uh, for women's security uh, in Kampala while I was together with some of you South Sudanese in Kenya. Um, and she told me, uh, my partner called me and said, you know, I've, I've just met Stella and all the media has been asking Stella, oh, tell us more about this kilt. We want to hear from Stella. And Stella's just so humble. Um, she said, I didn't make this kilt. Please talk to these people. <laughs> you know? So something that I really appreciate about Stella is that she builds up others. I know I'm not really giving kind of like a professional or political CV here, but I'm getting there, yeah? So um, I'm almost done, Stella. Good. <laughs> I don't get to flatter you that much, so. So uh, Stella is now in exile in Bavaria. She's organizing in the diaspora. She's organizing with East Africa's queer community. She's doing her powerful writing. She's a, she's a medical anthropologist. She's an academic. She's a performer. She might be Africa's most iconic radical feminist presently alive, at least amongst the, you know, the, the heavy hitters. She's a mother. She's a friend. She's eternally curious, and uh, she's a questioning intellectual powerhouse. We have her in our midst, and it's beautiful. She's uncompromising on her values. And I'm done now, Stella. I'm done. I'm done talking about her. So please join me in welcoming Stella. Right, so thank you very much. Um, I don't do praise very well because the work that we do is thankless, often. Um, I want to say I'm very grateful for the opportunity to close after a very long day. I came in yesterday with Maria and uh, I was screaming, South Sudanese, there is bribery at your airport. Now, in my country, I don't pay bribes. I call out people who pay bribes. I was carrying two laptops, one for myself and one for my sister, Susan Nyazi, who is sitting at the back. I don't have the opportunity to go back home. I am like this brother poet here from Tibet. I am stateless, although I carry a Ugandan passport. And so when I come to Sudan or to Kenya or to Tanzania, my family come to meet me, and I want to thank you very much, Matt, for allowing me the space to meet with my lover. He was here yesterday, and my sister was here yesterday. And I want to say that for me, at the end of a long day, I want to listen to a person. So I want to come couched as a person for the first time. Unfortunately, my voice is husky because I had to scream down the entire airport. I, I kid you not, I kid you not. They asked me for a bribe of a few South Sudanese pounds. And I said, why? And they said, because you have two laptops. And I said, what's wrong with that? And he sent me to a guy. And I thought, do you know who I am? Do you know what I do? Do you know that I don't take this nonsense? And I had watched a line of people paying double because they had visas in their passports and they were paying and nobody said anything. And so I was waiting to be given a small invitation to challenge what was happening. Now, I don't know who else was at the airport yesterday, but I screamed that airport down the military guys came, the police guys came, the immigration guys came.
They tried to harass me and my legs gave way because that is what traumatized people who have been beaten up in prisons for speaking truth to power do. I'm a traumatized person. When these police women and immigration women came to take me away because I say to the men, you can't come. One pennies, two pennies, three pennies, four pennies, five pennies, six pennies. I don't know what is surrounding your pennies, but I'm a woman. A single woman screaming with my voice and there are six penises around me call the women of Isas. Don't touch me. They were pushing me and throwing me. My sisters in South Sudan, what are you teaching the men here? You haven't taught them to respect a woman with a voice. So when the women came to harass me, I remembered the women at Luzira prison who beat me up when I was pregnant at 45 and I lost my baby. And when I saw this woman aggressively putting her talons on me, the protester in me didn't need provocation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to flee because my body is weak. My voice said, you have a voice. When my body backed out and I fell on that floor, they thought I was pretending. At your airport, South Sudanese, they tried to kick me. But a collapsed body is a collapsed body. When you're traumatized by the state, your mind knows you cannot fight them. So to protect you, it shuts down. My legs gave way. They tried to pull me away. My voice was there and I was screaming, I will not give you praise. Policemen should never touch women. If I'm a criminal, charge me. And my eyes were wide. And they thought they would do anything to me. I say to them, do you know that in my country I protest and throw off my clothes? I am a nude protester. I am a revolutionary, my brother. I am radical and I am rude. When I don't have a gun, I have a voice. When they took away my voice, I was being sentenced because of a poem that I wrote about President Yoweri Museveni. When I was being sentenced, not at the court. Uh-uh. Not in a woman's prison. Ah, the police, the prisons, and the courts in my country for a singular poem that I wrote decided to collude. And they took me all the way out of the women's prison. And they took me to Luzira Maximum Security Maxion Bay for condemned capital offenders. I'm a single woman. I have been convicted. A day after my conviction, they are taking me into the all-male prison, not the junior juveniles, not the young remand prisoners. They took me to the capital offenders prison for my sentence. And the men who had not seen a woman for a long time, they were like, eh, ah, uh, ooh. Uh, I wasn't laughing because nobody explained to me when the prisons and the courts in your countries collude to abuse justice. What do you do? And then I was put in a little room surrounded by male prison guards and the women who brought me in for prison uniform, they handed me over. I didn't know what to do. My lawyers were not there. My family was not there. Nobody explained to me that a female prisoner a woman who writes poetry to power can be taken and sentenced, surrounded by prisoners wanting to touch her flesh, male prison wardresses, and IT. You know IT? Information technology. There was a camera, and there were screens, and I was being projected into the courtroom. My political party members opposition member parties, academics, queers, women, poor people were in that courtroom and outside the courtroom. Television stations from all over were there. And I was not there. They had taken away your community. When they take your allies and your support, the solidarity we are talking for has been gathered. And they isolate you. What do you do? What do you do in that moment? There's IT. What do you do? If you're a revolutionary and they've taken everything away mm. if you like Stella as you say hey i have a voice and so they called me up to the podium and i said to them i have to know how does the technology work in here nobody explained to me and i said to them i have a bottle of water 
if you're not careful, I will pour this water in your technology. Show me. So I'm sussing out, I'm trying to find out what's going to happen. And then I saw a prison water, a prison warder walking towards a corner, right? And I realized that's where the cameras are. I'm going to scream that sign, right? Because they have to hear me in my courtroom at my sentencing. So I began screaming poetry, right? Rhyming and rhythming. And then you know what they did? Do you know what they did? Because the state will come at you. The example you gave was real. First, it was a man operating technology. And then the state gave him the power to switch off my voice. You're in a courtroom at your sentence. You want to challenge power and the state takes off your voice. What do you do? What do you do? People have said I'm mad. I'm insane. But if you're a fighter and you want to give them one good blow and you have five fingers, you know they are rude signs. So what do you do? You fold the four and you step with the middle finger and you hold up two middle fingers and you go like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. In the courtroom, I was not being impolite. I was not being rude. I was being a revolutionary because I knew they needed to see me at my sentence. And you know what happened? IT carried that message all over the world all over the world and then when my fingers were being very rude my face was cut off and my lower body was left they've taken away your voice they've taken away your community and it is doing things for you what do you do when you don't want to go out and let the set the enemy the oppressor win what do you do if you're still and and your ancestors walked nude you throw off those clothes Comrades, I pulled off my clothes. I took off my power bra. Now you're seeing me with a bra. These things look large. When the bra comes off, they become bazookas at the front line. Whirr, whirr. And I pulled out one bazooka in one hand and the second bazooka on the other hand. And the technology is on my breasts. And I jiggled those big breasts during my sentence. And the people in the courtroom are going, hey. And that day I was punished. But that day we won. We won because I said I am a revolutionary. I will ride on the history of women's protest. I had poetry. They took away my voice. What do you do at the last minute when you have to speak truth to brutal power? In my case, I don't know how to operate a gun. I don't know. In my case, I'm a professor without a job because I challenged the first lady in our country. Her name is Janet Museveni. They call her Mama Janet. Mama, the mother of the nation. The mother of the nation, my sister Angelina, is it? I want to thank you for that song. I have a pad. You sing, I have a ball. The president of my country promised sanitary menstruation material. Yes, I talk about taboo subjects. Menstruation is a natural process for all women as long as we are reproductive and healthy. The president of the country promised sanitary pads, menstrual materials during his men, uh, presidential campaign. And he said, if I go to power, I will give all the poor girls in this country free menstrual pads. And I had it. And then the poor people voted for him or maybe he rigged the elections. And then he was sworn into the presidency. After he was sworn in, he sent Mama Janet, the mother of the nation, to tell parliament there is no money. There is no money in the country to fulfill the menstruation pad promise. All the women, all the women, the good women in parliament, the women in church, the civil society organizations, they were so scared. And I thought, how many women menstruate? Is it only radical feminists who menstruate? Answer me. Is it only mad women like myself who menstruate? Is it only women in the opposition who menstruate? Don't your sisters menstruate? Menstruation should be a unifying cause whether you're a man or a woman. When the president reneged on his campaign promise, I thought, oh my God, this is an opportunity to unite all of Ugandans. We should arise and rise up. And so I wrote a poem. I took this song, this chant, 
they say in the civil society and human rights defender and peace movements in my country i have a ball i got menstruation pads and went on to tv and mobilized women using this chant and we'd hold our sanitary pads and raise up our black bodies and i would say i have a pad and the women would ask that i have a pad and i would put it here and the women would put it here and we would prepare like all women who menstruate prepare and i mobilized a lot of money using sanitary pad chants and going to tv and going online you know what happened i was abducted i was abducted by three cars full of gunmen wearing masks before corona started they came at me with guns and face masks and they took me away why this is important is because i have learned through hardship that even when we start for the right causes if the state wants to criminalize what you're doing they will and so what i think i thought i wanted to do was to do poetry but people are tired instead i shared my story with a broken voice like this this is how i scream against power because for me, I don't have a gun, but I have a brain. I can write poems. I have been told by poets in my country, you're not a poet. You're not a Shakespeare. We don't know you. You're too vulgar. But when the president in 2018 was telling whatever age he is, because he claims he's in his 70s, we think he's 100. When Yogar in the 70s was turning whatever age he turned in 2018, I wrote him a birthday poem. And I used the words of his mother's vagina. Don't say, are you we? My sister has copies of books. Please give out the books I brought to give out to people. There's a poem on page 17. I served 18 months for that poem. I was sentenced and convicted for a birthday poem that I wrote to Yoweri Museveni, telling him, Yoweri, it's your birthday today. I wish that your mother's pussy not meow, ah, not meow. The pussy of your mother had strangled you to death. I wasn't talking about pussies. If anybody has a mind, they'll say, what are the material conditions that gave birth to this monster that this woman wants to murder? The feminists in my country disowned me. Poop, poop, ah, ah, pussy. <laughs> right? And so all I want to say, her name is Susan, not poop. -poo um uh all i want to say as a way of introduction is whatever it is that you have i use the tools of a mad woman my naked body menstruation poetry and i always fight back right i look sweet i sound sweet but i fight back and i attack why why question why is it important to speak back why must we speak back why am I sharing my experience and sharing my books? There's a hand. Are you putting up a hand to answer my question? The books are enough. If you don't get it, you'll get a book. But why is it important to speak truth to power? No answers, feel, what do I do? When you have no reactions, yes. ask them again. What do you do? Why is it important for us to speak back to power? Why? There's a hand here, a hand here. I don't want the same old men answering the same old questions all the time. Why is it important to speak back truth to power? I have given you my example. I don't use polite language. I, I call the president a pair of buttocks. I went to prison the first time because again I wrote on Facebook and called my president a pair of buttocks. Right? I am vulgar, right? I am obscene, yes? You're saying no. But why is it important to use whatever tools we have to use to speak truth to power? Why? There's a hand. Yes, my sister. If you don't resist, you will be overpowered. Okay, so I've been told I have 17 minutes and then we will break for tea and questions. Aren't people tired? <laughs> Not again. Not again.
Sorry, you're not tired? Okay, so I think for me, I want to give you an alternative way of how I do nonviolent struggle. I was trained, I have a PhD in medical anthropology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In my country, if you speak truth to power and resist against an abusive state, you lose your job. In my country, I cannot speak about everywhere. I'm talking about my country, right? I have a Master of Science degree in medical anthropology from your University College London, okay? I could get a job anywhere, but I came back home. My first degree is in mass communication and literature, right? So I studied poetry. When the poets of your country denounce you, yet your books have taught you poetry, what is it saying about the sort of resistance that we do? And so all I want to introduce is when your education has been taken away from you, just like my voice was taken away from you. When your communities of support have been taken away from you, right? When the baby you hold in your future, in your womb, the one you're thinking, I want to fight for this baby, has been taken away from you as a punishment for your voice. What do you do in terms of speaking back? Right? You use what you have. You use what you have. Right? If I don't say anything else, if you don't make meaning of my madness, call me mad, I tell the people in my country, but use what you have. If you're an organizer, organize. If you're a thinker, think. If you're a professor, profess for the struggle. If you're a woman, you don't have to become a man to do what you're doing, right? But use what you have. I had the university, I was publishing academic articles and getting cited, right? I thought Phil would say she's an amazing academic. No, because that was taken away. But even when they take away your voice, you don't give up. You don't keep, you keep going, right? My productions were in the academic genre. I find I have to turn to poetry. Why? Because on Facebook, I don't need an editor. On Facebook, I don't need reviewers. On Facebook, I don't need permission. I get my phone and I Facebook a poem and the president sees it, why? because I've been consistent at criticizing the president. When they took the academic genre away from me, I went to social media. And so I think it was Maggie who said that social media in terms of new strategies, we have alternatives, we can't give up. It is not easy because from my example and from my country, there are new laws that have caught up with us. We have laws that criminalize our organizing and activities online, right? But you keep going because even when I was in prison because of social media work, I kept going. And the, I have a book called No Roses from My Mouth. I was in prison for one poem, right? The one where I called Yoweri Museveni a pair of buttocks and it's in my local language. I call him Matako Butako, the Kiswahili speakers will understand. It's the rudest way of saying the thing on which you sit, right? Yeah. Um, and when I was in prison for that singular poem, uh, at the application for my bail, the state of Uganda applied to subject me to involuntary mental exam. So they kept coming at you. They kept coming at you. The whole country in, my, in Uganda, they know that the state says I'm mentally ill. But even in my mental illness, I challenge people and say, you who is not mentally ill, what have you done? If a mad woman is doing what she's doing, what have you done? What are you doing for your country? Right? And when you start, it's not easy. I've been to, we were comparing statistics with Tenzin, right? He's been, did you say 22 times? 16, 16 times. And I say to him, uh, I'm not as good as you are, brother, <laughs> right? I know in the morning that somebody said for civil disobedience, you need huge numbers. What do you do when the numbers have been taken away from you? Right? I was handcuffed and naked uh, on a cold, wet floor in solitary confinement at Luzila Women Prison, right? 
had been beaten blue black and the visitation rights had been taken away from me the time just after that phil came to visit me but even in that confinement cell when there was no pen or paper because they began to confiscate my pens and papers i used the handcuffs on my hands to scratch emancipate yourselves from mental slavery into the walls of that solitary confinement I even had enough time. I signed my name, Stella Nyanz, and I put the year 2018. Why? Why? Because it's necessary to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. Sometimes we have solidarity and community. Sometimes all you have is the history of your ancestors. Sometimes all you have is to dig inside the reservoirs of your belly and say, I will raise up my head one more time Sometimes all you have is the examples of other women in countries like South Africa, where I watched, I had watched the lady, Mama Wini, she's not perfect, but I'd watched her incarcerated. But we don't give up, right? We don't give up if it means getting the very handcuffs of the people who have incarcerated you, you get those handcuffs and speak truth to power. I don't know if I have done what I was supposed to do, but I was showing you this book that after I wrote Emancipate Yourselves, this is Bob Marley, right? Bob Marley sang a song, Emancipate Yourselves from Mental Slavery. You talked about freeing the mind. Harriet Tubman said the worst slave that couldn't be rescued is the one who didn't know they were a slave. So I began to think, how do I challenge even in solitary confinement? They'd beaten me, I was naked. <laughs> But imagine the foolishness of the state. I'm a naked protester. Thinking you'll, breaking, you'll break me by making me naked means you don't know me. So I took to other tools. Um, and I think what I wanted to say is after writing that, I freed my mind and realized I don't need the approval and permission of the state to do what I do. And I wrote 195 poems, I think they are. These ones survived the confiscation and the burnings. And on the day of my acquittal, when I got out of prison, I had a book full of poems. The title is No Roses From My Mouth, right? Poems from prison. I want to read just one poem, Phil, if that's OK. Um, it's, I'll read this one called No Roses From My Mouth um because it talks about this question about uh civil civil nonviolent um struggle and although my poetry is vulgar i also have some really nice school poems so i'm not always vulgar also although i am dressed in protest many times i'm dressed <laughs> so no roses from my mouth right there will be no roses falling out of my mouth. And I'm writing this in prison, by the way, when the magistrate has said, I'm the most immoral woman that Uganda has had, that was in her judgment. I write, there will be no roses falling out of my mouth. Who brings fleeting beauty to war? Instead, there are razor blades and axes, chainsaws, knives and machetes, daggers, swords and bayonets. My words cut up our enemies. There will be no honey dripping out of my mouth. Who brings sweetness to war? Instead, there are punches and slaps, hammers, pickaxes and chisels, bulldozers, tankers and undercuts. My words knock out our oppressors. There will be no perfume spreading from my mouth. Who cares for aesthetics during war? Instead, there are bazookas and bullets, grenades, torpedoes, and missiles, machine guns, AK-47s, and Kalashnikovs. My words blow up the tyrants. This is the last one. There will be no orgasm coming from my mouth. Who cares about pleasure during war? Instead, there is venom and acid, bombs, landmines, and nukes, poisonous gas, and bioweapons. My words destroy our haters. And what I'm saying, poetry, call it whatever you do. I really don't care. I'm not looking for approval here. I'm at war with my poems, right? I look at my poetry as the only, the last resort that I have, the last resort that I have. 
the poetry book have given you is a red book. It's vulgar. It is my picture on the day of my acquittal. I'm wearing red combs in my hair, in my ears rather. Combs were about civilizing the colonized savages. Those combs remind me they once called us savages. If I have to be a savage to speak truth to power, I will. Right? And sometimes we just need these symbols to remind us who we are. If I call you mad, use your madness to speak truth to power, but keep doing what you do. And this book, Don't Come in My Mouth, sounds very sexually graphic. The title poem is called Felatio, an adult word, XX rated, if anybody knows what it means. But I'm actually telling the president, don't put your dirty words in my mouth. Don't come in my mouth. When I perform, don't come in my mouth. I'm like the disgusted woman who doesn't want a man to come in her mouth. But the whole nation understands what coming I'm saying. Don't put your words in my mouth. If you're a dictator, I will call you a dictator. Right? And for me, politeness has cost us lives in my country. Politeness and respectability and trying to conform means that at the South Sudanese immigration point, those women are going to harass a woman. Those men take breaks. They make foreign visitors pay twice because nobody has screamed down at them. I entered without paying a coin. I lost my voice. I lost my legs. It was temporary, right? So what am I saying? Do what you have to do. My last book came out, it's called Eulogies of My Mouth. When a dead man dies in Africa, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about his wrong things. We grieve so hard. When presidents die, we grieve so hard, the whole nation stops. When speakers of parliament die, we stop and grieve mockingly, even though they have beaten up our wives, stolen from the public coffers. Five minutes to go. When the speaker of parliament died this year, I wrote mockery poetry. I refused to be an African. And I invited all of Uganda. I was in exile in Germany. I invited all of Uganda using my social media platforms to dance at the grave of this enabler of the dictator. One poem got 500 likes. The second poem, so I was 57 years old or 58, I forget. The second poem got 1,000 likes. The third poem, I wrote 57 of them to mark his 57 life, years on life. By the time I had finished, my Facebook timeline had gone viral. When I was in Uganda, they could arrest me. In Germany, they can't touch me. People have said to me that exile is defeat. Exile is surrender. And I say to them, no, 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 no. Sometimes exile is just to go away and re-strategize because a dead soldier cannot fight. A dead soldier can do nothing. A dead mother cannot take care of the soldiers in the revolution she has raised. If you have to go a little time to exile so that you can protest up the walls of that building, go to exile. They will laugh at you. But in exile, we heal ourselves. In exile, we find our voices. In exile, we return. Get the strength to return. And so right now I'm in exile. I'm part of the Writers in Exile program in Germany. And I continue doing what I do, like feel said. I think that my time is up. I'm sorry I went off uh, a great program. But I just want to say here, people, I'm just a poet. They call me the mad poetess. They denounce me and deny me, right? But I'm doing my bit, sometimes alone, many times with others, often with women. Sometimes with queers, we've talked about national boundaries and borders. Sometimes the borders are so huge in our small internal communities. Sometimes the boundaries are between Muslim and Christian or whatever faith you have. Right? I cross borders for solidarity. But even in the opposition, even in our movements, they're oppressors. Even in our movements, they're patriarchs and homophobes and Islamophobes. Even in our movements, we need to clean ourselves. Therefore, for me, when I'm doing revolutionary work, I don't have a friend. I stand in solidarity with people, but I'm always eyes open for the oppressors in our beds. I thank you very much. I don't think there's time. I wanted to talk about uh, Derek Mate, a young man who has stood in solidarity with me. 
we had about an MP who was in the EFF in South Africa. Maggie, we celebrate you. In my case, I stood for politics after prison during Corona. I was targeted, right? And I thought the only way to survive until I get out of this country is to run for elections. So I went and ran. <laughs> I contested. I got a party card. I went all over Kampala with that young man, a medical student from Makerere University, from a different party at the time. He belongs to John Bazira's uh, political party. He stood with me with his photography. And the photography of Derek Mate is about me, the daughter of a medical doctor, going to slum areas to stand in solidarity with the poor people of Kampala. But why I want Derek uh, to show his photos, and maybe Phil will give him a, a minute, and maybe you can look at his photos, is because a medical doctor from a different region of my country, from a different ethnicity, from a different political party, stood in solidarity with me with his skills as a photographer. And his photographs have gone places exposing the rot in Kampala. And the rot in Kampala was under my own political party. But solidarity with him and his skill, although he's an artist and a creative, has allowed us to do work. And even though I lost the political campaign, this photo has moved with us all over the campaign. And we're going to put them in a book. And so solidarity could be at the national level it could be right down at the grassroots. Even after we lost the campaign, Derek Mate has been with me doing poetry in Kenyan slums and is here with me. And I want to thank you very much. Unless there is time for questions. There is time for questions. Oh, there is. Okay. Um, thank you very much again for the opportunity. I know we are late. <laughs> Thank you, still. Uh, thank you, sure. Uh, and thank you, Mate. Um, the first question will be from me oh, to Mate. Wow. I don't know. That's a little bit fake. Mate, are we welcome to give you a little cash contribution to take one of the photos home? Hi. Hi, 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 everyone. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. I'm called Derek Mate. Am I loud enough? No, no, come to here so that people Shall at home I can say away? other words, but don't go away. Sit there. No, just stand there. Hi, 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 hi. Yeah, it's good to be in front of all of you. I'm called Derek Mate. I am a medical doctor by training, trained in Makere University. For so now, I'm taking on the arts. I love art. I love taking pictures and a lot of what you see in the room was printed in Sudan, in Juba. I would have loved to have better looking work for you to buy, but unfortunately, this is what we could get in Juba. Apart from the other picture, which is really bold by Max. <clears throat> yeah, Max. Oh, and really for that one. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can you can contribute to the book coming out. We are working on a photo book where I am hoping to have all these pictures of Stella telling her story around Kampala, telling the plight of the poor women in Kampala, to share with you, to share with the world. Maybe one day in your living room, you will have very many pictures of Stella, a woman being a lot to transform her community. And thank you very much. We don't have a lot of time. I wish I could talk and talk and talk. Hi, mommy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you can contribute to the uh, photo book coming up, but uh, yeah, and you can buy a print, you can get it signed by Stella and me. Thank you very much. I don't want to take a lot of time. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the opportunity. My pictures are illegal in Uganda. I'm not allowed to exhibit anywhere in Uganda because. There are pictures of Stella, so being in Juba in a foreign land. So I need that and, one, Stella. <laughs> not free. Yeah, oh, I'm, 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 I'm happy I'm in a free land where I can share my work, share my art, and share it with the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for fighting for justice. Thank you for fighting for a better world. And keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mate. So, um,
I'm glad that I see some people already getting some tea. So let's uh, take that as a, a welcome sign to get some tea. But I also want to keep the energy going. I think the energy is high, even though we've had a long day. And I don't want to just totally diffuse it by like sending us all to a long queue. So if you see the queue is short and you're feeling thirsty, uh, head over to the tea table. But we're going to keep the conversation going. So before we open it up for sort of like plenary questions, Hold those thoughts for those of those hands that I see in the air. Uh, get together with two people sitting around you, so groups of three, and come up with one question as a group of three that you would like to ask Stella. And then what we're going to do is each group is going to share their question, just a one sentence question. Stella is going to write them down, because I know you're always taking notes on everything. Yeah. And then you can decide which ones, if any, you want to respond to. And then after that, we'll open it for more of like a plenary, a normal plenary kind of uh, Q&A kind of thing. Sound good? OK, so uh, two minutes with your group of three. Come up with a question. How much time do we have to and the people have been going up to our let me take one. Uh, <laughs> you know <what>? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I hope every triad in the room has one question for Sam. <laughs> At least one. Okay. So uh, I'm going to pass the mic around to every little group. Just read your questions. That's all we need from you at this point in the program. Stella, are you ready to take yes, notes? Yes, I am. Yes, is that you? Okay. Um, what is this? This is not All right. So, uh, starting from the left. Uh, still at nine, we talk, discussed um, your presentation and our meeting with you earlier. Our question was um, as a poet and also as a revolutionary. Um, and writing poetry. Our question is: When was the first time where you thought that I could write, write poetry? What, what was the first moment of inspiration? Right, so I'm getting questions. That is, that is. Our Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I want to take this opportunity to thank both that Stella uh, for the work she's doing while in exile. Uh, for us, people who are also still on the ground. I want to assert that Dr. Stella is one of the persons who inspired us even to drop our studies to focus on the country liberation and fighting against dictatorship. Uh, having the PhD, we saw that our bachelors couldn't count much 
than the country we are looking at. Doctor, thank you so much. Our question uh, from our group is that, uh, is there any person who inspired you to take the direction of taking? And also, are there the younger people, younger ladies, you are, you are looking up to mentoring or grooming to carry on the work you're doing? Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, just one question. Just That should be one sentence, right? What's your question? One sentence of a question. Right. I just want to thank uh, our dear Stella, but also to encourage uh, what you are doing is not in vain. You are actually helping so many people to really build their muscles, if I can put it that way. Not the many sentences. Okay. <laughs> okay, the question is, I like one thing you talked about, people uh, going for exile. We have had those experiences in the country. And every time you are talking about it, for me, it really brought out as a way of re strategizing so that you can get here for more effort, more energy, so that you can come back with new strength. And I think this is a lesson because we have had those experiences here. Wonderful. Thank you. We're bringing. Yes, we're going from group to group, and every group will get a chance to post their question. Stella is writing down all the questions, and then she will select which of these do I want to respond to. That's how this uh, protocol is. And um, it's important that we kind of like reconvene because we're kind of uh, losing the morale here. Yes. I'm showing the, the people that got questions. Yes. Well, I think eh, definitivamente es una historia muy, muy fuerte que nos sigue llenando de valor, de valentía y queríamos saber precisamente cuál fue lo que a ti te inspiró desde niña para luchar y continuar y hacer esa revolución en tu vida. Uh, thank you, that was so, such a powerful story, um, and it gives us so much strength. I want to ask, what was your inspiration at, since you were young um, to, to continue the struggle and to um, continue uh, the revolution? Our question has been asked by well, different people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Estela. I have one question. I know you're good at the other one. But what are, what, what are some of the strategies that you use for inclusive advocacy? Focus on your person's disability in different angles. I know you have a lot of poems. But I don't know whether you have one on, on inclusivity. Because if you know one behind, it promotes human rights better. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stella Jansi. I'm from Uganda. Hi. Hi. Well done. Um, you are a doctor at the university, also studied, so glad you are meeting here. My question to you yes, we value your contributions and we give the encouragement. What do you tell the Ugandans back home who are still struggling with the same situation that you learned? What is your word? Hi Stella. I, I want to say this. I didn't know you in person. I'm just knowing you today in person. But I knew you so much for the Particularly when the speaker died. And what you said really hurt the truly so much when you say, oh, now he has died, let the truly stay that they have drums and go and dance. People didn't like it. Although in your uh, Facebook, they stick light, but they thought your advocacy against the president was not uh, good at the time of the funeral. 
But later on, because uh, many people didn't understand why you were saying what you were saying. Later on, some people start saying, you don't know the crazy? <laughs> you don't know the crazy uh, Stella? Stella is not really hinting or hurting the dead speaker, but he's talking of the government, the way the government has been oppressing people. And some of the people in the government. Now, um, I want to say I've met you. I'm going to write to the police that I met this the, the, the they call you what? The crazy Stella. The witch. No, they call you crazy. Nah. I will tell them I met the crazy Stella and I understand why she is saying what she said against the speaker. But there is a question from the group. The group said, Are you never afraid? Yeah. Are you never afraid even when you are in exile? Because uh, the government in Uganda is known of abducting people when in exile. How do you transform your end? Who's next? Okay, and then I'll go back when you're done. Okay, go. Thank you so much, Stella Yanzi. My question is. How has your message been received by some of the neighboring countries of Uganda, such as Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Congo, etc.? Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Andrew. And so I will end with a comment for Stella. It's called Fragile, and it goes like this. In your eyes that shift with the anxieties of these times, I see the deepest compassion imaginable. For the perpetrators in all we are, the survivor victims we're forced to be. In your wide open gaze, I see reflected my very own soul. And for your single act of kindness, I offer you my fragile heart. Have I missed any small group? Great. Stella, lots of questions. Respond as you wish. Um, I'm sorry, so so um, um, you made me want to cry um, because it's a powerful poem uh, and I thank you for it. That is the response of people to my poetry. Uh, a lady said the Acholi people are mad. I don't write poems without an intention. First, I have to provoke a reaction and sometimes you need the mad anger for people to sit and begin talking about a topic. My poems are agenda setting. How does a single person in their bedroom with a phone reset the agenda? First time, you might need the anger of the masses. And sometimes the problem with poetry, which invites interpretation, is people miss the message and they stay with the symbol. That is why in my country, she said, the Acholi were very angry because at first they did not understand. Then they called you mad. So in many other countries, I get licensed because they say she's insane. And that protects me. But we know from history that women who are called insane, right, are those women who change history. History change makers are not going to be afraid of calling, call me whatever name, I don't care. I have a mission, I have an agenda to set, I have a truth to tell the dictator, call me what you want, I'm going to do it. So the, the, the response across countries is different. Uh, I was asked, am I not afraid? I'm very afraid. I'm always afraid. Part of what prison did to me is to make me paranoid. I was poisoned. So the, the person who talked about the actually poetry, the speaker of parliament, there were rumors about poisoning. And his father, his very own father, mentioned that he was poisoned. In our dictatorship, the dictatorship skills its enemies as well as its friends. And in parliament, military men have confessed they don't eat at the parliamentary canteen because poison is real. When I left prison after my 16 uh, month sentence, Two months later, I was admitted. 
in hospital because my kidneys were failing. And this is on the record. The general hospital, private hospital called Mengo Hospital, where I was had to refer me because the military had begun coming and they could not handle my case anymore. If they confirmed that my diagnosis was poisoning, there were implications for their license, right? So when I write eulogies of my mouth, the poems she's talking about, <laughs> it was personal. I had an opportunity to tell the country, the state, the government, you're poisoning us, but not just us in the opposition. You're poisoning your own. You've poisoned our water. You've poisoned our economy. You've poisoned our politics. You've poisoned our universities. You've poisoned our young people. And my eulogies are centered on this one man's death, but I don't know him. I've, not, I've never met him, but he's an enabler of a regime that murders men and women and children and futures and institutions. So why can't I dance on this one grave as a symbol of defiance and resistance? Um, and I, I think that response for me is, is an important kind of explanation that I think when you've lost it all, right? When you've lost it all, you lost your education, you lost your employment, you lost your life, you lost your marriage, you lost even your citizenship. Sometimes when you have nothing to lose, you become the most dangerous person. So the person who said, aren't you afraid? Many times I'm very afraid, but um, there's a whole lineage. So someone said to me, there's a whole theology of women warriors in my country, in Africa, in the world. Women have done things. But where there are no women role models, I look for the men. Where the men and women lack, I will look at our historical legends. Because sometimes you just need one example to run with. And for me, I get inspiration from whatever there is. I will work with it. Who inspires me? There's a woman called Wangari Madai. I don't know if there are any Kenyans in the room. I think that. Actually, I wanted to comment that. Right. I wasn't given the opportunity. Okay. Yes. So people have said to me it is an African to undress in protest. Those people don't know Africa, <laughs> they don't know the place in Africa where I come from, where women who should not be protecting themselves according to the patriarchal order lose the protection of men and these women take up the last tool that we have our wounds our breasts and we put them on the front line and it's usually elderly women we have these cultural sayings about the naked cast i don't believe in the naked cast but if my people did it, and I need to do it to make a statement, I will mobilize that historical, cultural legend, that myth of origin. If there were women, I mean, the feminist movement in Uganda hates me. Because women with privilege such as I have don't do the sort of things that I do. They don't stand with poor girls who menstruate and then lick on their uniforms and can't go to school. Respectable women do not stand with prisoners and ex-prisoners. Respectable women with degrees, they don't do this sort of thing of being in the opposition. The opposition is for failed women, mm. right? And so when we use our privilege, knowing and consciously choosing to use our privilege for the other side, I think that we need the inspiration of others. So I stand on the shoulders of Wangari Madai, a woman who is hailed by the women's movement in my country. Sadly, they disowned me and feminists. Many feminists went to Ugandan TV and said, Stella Nyazi is mad. Miriam Atembe did this. My Ugandan brothers, you can attest to this. Leading feminists hate me, but they've forgotten our history. They've forgotten that warriors in Dahomey, those women warriors of Dahomey, they have forgotten recent history among the women from Niger data who undressed, the women in the customers undressed in protest. And when a woman is fighting for her land in northern Uganda, which she told us about among the Acholi. She throws off her clothes. And so what respectability politics says is they say that Stella Nyanzi is not a poor woman. She's not a widow, a widow fighting for her land. Why does she do these mad things? And I think for me, it's the fight for humanity and freedom. So I don't know who said freedom. There's a difference between freedom and independence. I thank you for that quotation because there's also a difference between liberty Freedom. Many of us are not in jail, but we're not free. We live in prisons. Even now, 
live in prisons. Anyway, uh, the last question perhaps that I will address was when did you start writing? Why did you start writing? I've always written poetry. I didn't know it was powerful. Does that make sense? Yeah. When we go to school as kids, that's why I said, use what you have. It doesn't have to be special. A mad woman in Uganda uses poetry. Some of you have, I don't know what. Think about yourself. What do you have? What resource can you bring to whatever struggle you're interested in? Right? So I was always writing poetry. I wrote naughty poems to my father, my sister Susan, and I, uh, uh, when we were little, we used to talk about my parents and uh, we wanted to talk in code about my father who was a loving father, but a terrible husband. And uh, we had a little poem, my father, my father, he married a crocodile, she bites, she bites. And it was in the family when we were little and we used to laugh about it. Um, and and this nasty little poems, we've lived with them uh, coping as children in violent home, a violent home, but we had to cover up because our father was a medical doctor and our mother is the daughter of a reverend and religion lives with us. We had to cover up. And it was poetry that made us, we, we made meaning of life that way. My biggest inspiration is my mother. She's a woman who produced four girls. No. Not mm. the in-laws hated her. <laughs> they hated her. You find it funny, I did. I didn't understand why my grandmother hated my mother and she hated us. And my mother raised us saying, Stella, one clever girl is much better than ten boys who are stupid. <laughs> my mother said to me, I would rather have one brilliant girl with a voice, yes, than ten silent boys. And, I mean, how do you teach your children to fight? It begins in the home. It begins at home. If you have a home and children, or you have people who look to you, my mother is my biggest inspiration. I didn't have to look at feminists. I was sucking feminism from her breast and from her kitchen pot. Right? I learned to be radical because I saw her standing with her hand like that and talking at my father. Yes! And she's an African woman. She's also the daughter of an Anglican reverend. Right? And so speaking truth to power was in my home. There's nothing rude about what I do. She would not do, say the words that I say to authority. She taught me to you know, be a good Christian, respectable woman. But a time comes when you violate even mama's word. If mama's word keeps you in bondage. If you don't know you're a slave... Yeah. You stay in the streets. Thank you very much. Phil has come. If I haven't answered your question, it's not. Oh, the message to the people in Uganda is keep up the struggle. We have a dictator. His name is Dictator Yoweri Museveni. That man has to go. Right? No two ways about it. Uganda will not be free until Yoweri Museveni is free. Those of us who are feminists, the women in Uganda will not be free until Yoweri Museveni leaves. The state running of our country, if you're an anti-capitalist, if you're anti-war, whatever your cause is, until Yoweri Museveni leaves Uganda, maybe not physically, but the matters of Uganda, Uganda is not free. Whether one is for his party or against his party, we need allies and we need to mobilize. And those of you who are not in Uganda, please put up pressure. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know why, but find a reason to stand with Uganda because we live under military dictatorship that uh, masquerades around as a democracy because we have elections every five years. I have told them a woman I was abducted by gunmen. I'm not the first person. There's so many young people and men who are in prisons, they disappeared. It is, it is, I want to talk about my country because I didn't come to do that. But one word for Ugandans, if we don't fight, we are dead, right? We'll die with a dictatorship. I don't want my children to say, oh, mama was fighting and then she died and the dictator is still here. Ah, I want to dance on the grave of Yoweri Museveni. Not as a witch, but as Ugandans who have liberated ourselves. You're laughing, but I want to laugh at home and freedom as I am here. Thank you very much, Phil, for the opportunity. And I wish you a good conference.
thank you so much. What an amazing revolutionary day. I assume there's maybe a conclusion or housekeeping. I can pass the mic to maybe Matt or someone. Um, I, I, I would not take the mic. Uh, there's housekeeping, but Moses, Moses?